So I assume to get this video to play, you had to click something. The question of the day is, did you have any control over that clicking? You probably feel like you made the decision to click that button, but did you really? Were there forces beyond your control and beyond your understanding that caused you to make that clicking? This is, of course, the topic of Solomon's The Little Philosophy Book, Chapter 5, Freedom and Responsibility. And Solomon presents at least three different options we can entertain when thinking about whether or not we have free will and what that even means. I want to present those three different options in this way as chains, choice, and chance. On one end of the spectrum, we have absolutely no control over what we do whatsoever. It's all determined by forces beyond our control and understanding. In the middle, we've got choice, agency. We really do have free will, and I'll talk about what that means. At the other end of the spectrum, we have chance, where everything is just completely random, which would be almost as unattractive as chains. So first of all, determinism and fatalism. Fatalism is the view that only the big events in life are predetermined, such as who's going to be president, when will the world wars occur, perhaps who your spouse will be, etc. Determinism is the more stringent view that absolutely everything that you do and everything that you at least seem to decide is determined by forces beyond your control and understanding, such as the forces of nature. And this is a view that was popularized by Newtonian physics and by the view that we are essentially material beings. That is, if we are essentially our physical brains, if that's where consciousness lies and that's where the, the center of our personality is, well, our brains are simply biological. And biology breaks down into chemistry, and chemistry breaks down into physics. Therefore, if our brains are biological, chemical, physical, they must abide by the laws of physics. And so just as when I'm playing pool and I hit the cue ball, and the cue ball smacks into the one ball and it goes into the corner pocket, just as the cue ball had no say in what its trajectory or its speed was, and just as the one ball had no say in what its trajectory or what its speed was, perhaps it's the, perhaps it's the case that whatever's going on inside of my mind right now, I have no control over whatsoever. Maybe it's just billiard balls smacking against one another. Maybe it's the result of my genes and my previous experience experiences and the things that have happened to me from my environment, maybe the very words that are coming out of my mouth at this very moment are completely beyond my control. I feel like I'm making a decision on how to present this material and on what to say and what examples to use and whether to do this outside walking down the sidewalk or to do it in my, my home office with my children's lovely artwork in the background. I feel like those were all conscious decisions that I made based on the fact that the lighting was bad outside and uh, I want to show off my kids' artwork. But maybe all that stuff was completely determined. That's determinism. The other end of the spectrum is the chance. And so if you're visualizing this stuff, you might think, of course, of a physical change, maybe a ball and chain around someone's ankle. On the other end of the spectrum, of course, we have chance, and you might think about a pair of dice. You roll the dice, they come up a one, they come up, uh, I guess not two, they come up not a one, but they come up uh, snake eyes, or they come up two sixes, or whatever. It's just completely random. You don't have any control. Uh, it's very difficult, I assume, anyway, to, to flick your wrist in a certain way such that certain numbers will come up intentionally. Maybe that's what's going on inside our brains. And so this is a view that was popularized by subatomic physics, by the discovery, which I'm told anyway, that scientists have made, that subatomic particles behave in random ways. So they'll, they'll shoot things that, uh, I guess, electrons. I'm really not sure. I should know more about this. But uh, say they aim electrons at a screen. And they shoot them once, and the electrons hit a bit to the left. They shoot them twice, they aim a bit to the right. They shoot them again, they aim to the middle. It's a random pattern. In fact, there's no pattern. They go this way, that way. They're recreating the same conditions each time, but the subatomic particles don't follow the same tra trajectory, the same path. They don't do the same thing. They behave randomly. And so this opened the door that, well, perhaps it's the case that the same sort of thing goes on inside our brains. Maybe there's some sort of randomness in there that allows us to escape the, the rules of physics and have free will. However, that doesn't sound like an escape from free will that we really want. That seems to be something that's just as unattractive as determinism. Because if everything's random, we don't have any control. We want to have control of our decisions. We want to feel like we're the, the source of our decisions, the wellspring, the, the author, the agent that makes those decisions. And if everything's random, that's just as bad. And so right down the middle, what we want is choice, it's agency, it's free will, and we might wonder how we should even define that. On page 62, Solomon defines it as the ability to make decisions, to choose one option rather than another. That, that seems central. To plan and deliberate what we will do to even act against our own desires and interests. 
And so with that understanding, the ability to, to choose one option over others, to have several options before us, and actually be the author, the agent, the entity that decides which we're going to take, that's what it means to have free will, at least based on his definition, which makes some sense to me. You might worry at the same time that, well, determinism makes, makes some sense if we're essentially physical creatures. And you might even think that determinism is more uh, credible or has even more weight behind it if we take into account instincts, the fact that instincts influence our behavior, genetics influences our personality and our behavior, and our subconscious minds. If you've studied psychology, don't you know anything at all about Freud or modern-day psychology, you know that there are a lot of subconscious desires and uh, memories all sorts of things that have all sorts of control over what we do. To the extent that subconscious things and our instincts and our genes influence our decisions, we have less and less control and less and less free will. And to the extent that we're determined by physical forces, we have less and less free will. So some philosophers come up with views that are called compatibilist, and that is views that say that we still have free will even in light of physical determinism and subconscious influences, etc., and here are three different compatibilistic views. First is Kant's rational autonomy. Kant probably wouldn't have called this compatibilism, but that's what it's deemed now. And Kant argues that to the extent that we are able to reflect on the reasons for and against the different choices that we make and decide whichever one makes the most sense to us, we're free in that sense. And so we're able to deliberate. We're able to say, I want to do my lecture today in the office for this reason, that reason, that reason. I want to uh, go outside later and take a, a bike ride with the family for this reason, this reason, this reason. And I've got other options, different ways I could spend my day, different ways I could uh, present my lecture, but this is the one I want to take for these reasons. Kant, it's worthy of note, was a devout Christian, and he thought that we were, in fact, physically determined that the physical world was governed by the laws of nature, but at the same time, since we were able to rationally deliberate over our decisions, that gave us an adequate degree of freedom such that we could consider ourselves to be free. You can think about whether or not that makes sense. We also have Frankfurt's second-order desires. This is another compatibilistic view. A first-order desire is something such as, I would like to smoke a cigarette. And I used to smoke, so I know what this, this desire and this wanting feels like. And so, man, I really wish I had a smoke right now. It would feel great, and it would, it would get rid of this, this hunger and this, this, uh, this thirst for nicotine. Uh, it would just feel awesome. That's a first-order desire. The second-order desire would be, I don't want to be the sort of person who desires cigarettes anymore. The fact that I was able to have the second order desire to want to become the sort of person who didn't want to smoke cigarettes allowed me to break that habit and get rid of those first order desires. And so if I were a complete slave to my first order desires, in a way that we might say that non-human animals are, very smart dogs make lots of complex decisions, but they presumably don't make decisions about the sorts of persons, the sorts of dogs, they're going to become. And so uh, they don't think, I wish I didn't want to chase cars so much. I wish I was the sort of dog who didn't want to chase cars. They just chase cars when they see cars. And perhaps their owner trains them to not want to chase, ca chase cars. Perhaps they give them different incentives and such. But dogs don't make direct decisions to not want to chase cars. We can do that, and that gives us some degree of freedom, Ar he argues Frankfurt, even if lots of other things are determined by the physical world. And last, we have Sartre's existentialism. So this is another compatibilistic view. And I don't fully understand Sartre's existentialism. I've not read that much about Sartre. So I'm just going to tell you what Solomon has told us and what I've, I've been told by others. And Sartre simply argued that we, we are radically free. We have the ability to become whatever sort of person that we want to become and that we should embrace that. And the fact that we have the ability to change our lives and change ourselves at the drop of a hat makes us incredibly responsible for our decisions for everything that's happened to us and everything that will happen to us. I think that as a prudential matter, just as a matter of living your life in a good way, this is an excellent view to take because to the extent that you feel like you're a victim, that you have no control of your life, you'll continue to be a victim. You'll continue to have no control. And so if you want to live a better life, I think you should